Welcome to the New Books Network. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books and Sports, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Bennett Kerber, the host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Brian D. Bunk about his new book, From Football to Soccer, The Early History of the Beautiful Game in the United States. Uh, Brian Bunk, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Well, Brian, I wonder if uh, you could begin the interview by telling us a bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And um, although soccer was played in those places, uh, I vaguely remember uh, the Minnesota kicks um, from the old NASL when I was growing up. I never really played any soccer uh, at all. Um, The part of Wisconsin that I grew up in was mainly a basketball and an American football place. Um, and so it really was not an important part of my childhood, either as a player or a fan, which maybe is a little surprising that, you know, someone would write a whole book about a sport that they don't have much of a background in. So um, I went to uh, college at the University of Minnesota in, in Minneapolis, and then I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison. I initially started out as a specialist in modern Spain, um, and I did research mainly as a in um, cultural history. And I wrote a book about well, I wrote a dissertation that became a book on an, uh, a revolution that took place in Spain in October 1934, and that was published by Duke University Press in 2007. And um, and then for a variety of reasons, which I guess we can get into. Um, I switched over uh, to U.S. history and and the history of soccer more specifically. Yeah, that's that's fascinating to me how uh, how you went from to soccer from what your dissertation topic and first book. And obviously, you said you didn't play growing up; you had passing memories of soccer. Um, so yeah, that I think myself, all the listeners would love to know how you came to write uh, from football to soccer and how that transition occurred. Sure. I mean, I should say that I I later found out when I met the uh, Alan Gutman, who I'm sure listeners are familiar with his work. Um, he started out uh, studying American literature, and I think his first book was on um, American literary responses to the Spanish Civil War. So, not that I'm comparing myself to the great Alan Gutman, but at least I'm not the first person to transition from studying something related to Spain and the Spanish Civil War to sport history more broadly. So. Um, so I'd finished my my dissertation or finished uh, revising it into a, a book, and I was looking for another research topic. I had a variety of ideas, but at the time um, we had just started a family. We just said our our, um, our daughter was born. Um, oh, she was young at the time that the book came out. Uh, I also did not have a permanent academic position, so I didn't really have access to. Um, a, re- a research budget or the ability to spend large amounts of time overseas. I mean, when I was working on my dissertation, I was fortunate enough to get a Fulbright uh, fellowship. And so I could spend almost an entire year conducting research uh, in in the archives in Spain. And I knew that was not really going to happen. So I started um, for a variety of reasons. I, I became interested in the Spanish immigrant community to New York City. Um, New York City is fairly close to where uh, we live. And I had a friend who was living in the city. So it was fun and easy to go down and do research. And as I was conducting research on this community, I discovered that they had their own soccer league in the 1920s called the Spanish American Soccer League. And I had become a fan of soccer um, when I spent time in Europe, Um, initially as an undergraduate in 1990. Um, you know, seeing the World Cup for the first time live was pretty exciting. And then I had sort of begun to follow it as a European historian. You can't help but note the importance of soccer uh, in those cultures, including Spain's. Uh, and so I was, uh, you know, a fan of the sport by that point. And so then I became more interested in this league and these teams that were formed in New York City uh, in the 1920s. And I thought, well, I'll just go and find you know, what are the books on American soccer history or U.S. soccer history to learn a little bit more about, you know, how widespread was this? Was this unusual? Where did this fit into the broader uh, 
uh, history of the sport in the United States. And I found that there was not really much at all that had been written about the history of soccer. Um, there were a few uh, really groundbreaking uh, people working in the field, Roger Alloway, Colin Joes, uh, David Litterer. Uh, later, I would meet Mel Smith. Um, but they were all, I mean, these are all non-academics. Um, and they were uh, still, uh, you know, not that that's, uh, there's nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, there was really not a lot of academic work on the topic. Um, and so then that made me more interested in researching the broader history of the sport um, in the U.S. Oh, that's, and and it's funny, you said you started in the 1920s. And as I read the book, um, I noticed that you started much earlier than the 1920s in that first chapter. Whenever you say the early history of the beautiful game, uh, you, you really mean early. So uh, you begin your book with indigenous football in North America, a period many historians would uh, classify as, you know, quote unquote, pre-modern sport. Um, but can you tell us more about this early period of football in North America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, maybe I can explain how I sort of began to move backwards. Um, I, I did eventually publish an article in the Journal of Urban History on the Spanish-American Soccer League. Um, and then as I began to interact more with, uh, you know, a kind of international network of people who were working on soccer, especially in England, and I became more familiar with the literature on the history of English soccer. And um, there was, um, or maybe still is, um, a debate about the origins of English soccer, um, whether it was primarily in the public schools, places like Eton and rugby and those sorts of institutions, or whether it had a more kind of working class uh, set of origins that emerged out of um folk football and these other sorts of games that were played um, by non-elites, essentially. And so as I became more exposed to that literature and I read more widely, I, I wanted to see what was the case in the United States, essentially. How did that compare to what was going on in England and, and, and Scotland and, in, you know, in the United Kingdom more generally? And so that's sort of how I began to to look backwards a little bit about, um, you know, from the period of the 1920s to these much earlier eras. And so as I was beginning to look, I, I kept pushing uh, the start date back and back and back. And I had read a little bit about Native American ball games and um, a lot of the literature has been focused on lacrosse. Um, but there were kicking games. There were um, you know, other sorts of ball games that were played. And so I decided to sort of focus on the evolution or the, the meanings, the different uh, ways in which uh, various groups used these kicking games or, or incorporated them into their social and cultural lives. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fascinating to me. Like you said, I knew a lot about lacrosse, um, but I did not know about the kicking games in Indigenous America. So that was actually a great, a pleasant surprise uh, just starting out. Um, and then you kind of move on to... Um, Football and colonial America is still called football, I guess, at this time. And we can get into that when that transition to soccer kind of happens as we go along. Um, but you refer to colonial football in the United States as um, the schoolboys game. So what do you mean by this? And how did football being a schoolboys game um, influence its development in the U.S. Uh, throughout the 19th century? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, obviously, when... Um settlers, uh, European settlers, especially from the United Kingdom, Great Britain came to North America, they imported their own cultural uh, and recreational traditions and pastimes. And so they brought with them this tradition of playing football, um, especially on special occasions like religious holidays and, and, and so forth. And it, it's difficult to identify uh, all sorts of references to these sorts of activities. I think it might be partly a result of the fact that um, the populations were still fairly small, uh, at least in, in the early period, and that the, um, you know, there wasn't maybe a lot of opportunity for recreational time to play these games, except on certain feast days or special occasions. But it does seem, given the, the fact that newspapers from early on uh, in the colonial period mention football um, 
in a way that's clear that everybody knows what it is and that it does. They use it often as a metaphor for um, political squabbles. Uh, you know, they re- often talk about things becoming a political football or tossed about like a football. And so it seemed pretty clear that um, knowledge of this game was was widespread and that the newspaper, the few times when it would be mentioned in the newspaper, they didn't feel the need to explain what this was or how it was played. And so I, I think that it was generally um, an activity that young boys played maybe almost every day or, you know, on their way to school or, or you know, in any free time. And the few glimpses that we get into the in, in, in the newspapers is often when there's something bad happens as a result. So I remember I, I'm not sure I included this in the book, but there was a, a story um, about how some boys who were in a in a like a juvenile institution uh you know a juvenile detention center whatever it was called at the time and they kicked a football over the over the fence and then it, it this sort of spurred a, a breakout uh or unfortunate instances where um you know some child was was run over by a cart chasing a football into the street um that sort of thing um or um, it would be in in laws that were passed preventing people from playing football on the streets because it would you know run in you know hit people in the head. These are heavy leather balls uh, that you know probably could do a lot of damage or um, damage property or frighten the horses and lead them to bolt and that sort of thing. So it we see these little glimpses at the margins of of sport, but it does seem to me that it was pretty. Um, common and that the the people who tended to play it the most were were schoolboys and young men who didn't necessarily have the same sorts of responsibilities or attachments to their time as as they would once they got older. Well, so that yeah, the, like you mentioned, it seems like the perception was that it was a boys' game, and perhaps as as you just noted in those stories, an unruly boys' game was maybe the perception at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, although a child's game, you know that this didn't stop adult men from playing in the 19th century. Um, and, and maybe while not as common as children, you reference four major types of football played outside schools or, or amongst young boys. Um, the first being nostalgia football, uh, the second being holiday football, the third being military football. And finally, the fourth club football. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about these uh, different adult versions of the game. Sure. Um, well, the first three are generally times when um, adult men might have more freedom uh, um, or the the sort of sense of responsibility or the weight of responsibility of employment or other sorts of, um, you know, activities was was. Uh, removed temporarily, usually. Uh, and so the first one, nostalgia football, was a time when adult men would return to their alma mater or to you know where they grew up, and they would often join in with the current group of schoolboys at that institution and play a football match, or they might organize a football match among uh, alumni of the institution that was sort of separate. Um, and so it was a way, again, of reliving this time when they were boys and they could play this game and and presumably they had more freedom, um, you know, um, didn't have the responsibilities or the attachments of, of adult men. And so it was a way, uh, you know, it, it was a time when they felt free uh, to be a kid again and to play this kid's game. Uh, holiday football is a similar sort of thing on a holiday like especially Thanksgiving or Christmas. And this is goes back to some of those earlier traditions and even dates back to the traditions within Great Britain about, um, you know, Shrove Tuesday football matches or other uh, special occasions surrounding religious holidays. Um, so again, Thanksgiving and Christmas were oftentimes, um, you know, we tend to think of college football on Thanksgiving or, uh, you know, now I guess they do play professional football on, well, they play but on football, uh, professional football on Thanksgiving too, but now they play it on Christmas or Christmas Eve um, as well. Uh, but that, that the roots of that, um, that process, you know, go way, way back. And so we do see in the 19th century adult men playing this boys game on, on holidays. Um, and, and then military football, again, it, it's a similar sort of thing. You're in a, a, a male dominated environment. Um, they often have, a lot of free time after they're 
uh, you know, drilling or their responsibilities end. And so um, this was a, another way to fill to fill the time and, and, a, and a, an opportunity to, again, take part in this activity that they likely had had done when they were boys. Oh, and then club football. Yeah, club football is a little bit of a different thing. Club football is when, um, as just as it sounds, organized, uh, you know, a, a group of individuals would come together to form a club. Uh, usually one that would be, um, you know, long lasting or at least, you know, semi-permanent, I guess we might say, not just for one single occasion, although that did happen too. Uh, and then they would play or organize football matches. It, there's very little evidence that this was a widespread practice in the United States. Um, in England, you do see this happening in places like around pubs, for instance, these small sided kicking games would be formed and they'd place wagers or, um, you know, they would have not necessarily organized competitions, but, but something more than just the, the sort of loosely organized type of folk football. And in the United States, that doesn't seem to really, um, to really happen in the same way as it does in England, especially. Um, we do so find a few scattered instances here and there of clubs that seem to form. Uh, for the most part, they seem to only play games amongst themselves or amongst the team members and not against other clubs. Um, and so it's it's an area where, um, you know, maybe if it, as new evidence emerges, new uh, or more newspapers are digitized, we might find more evidence for that. But for the most part, it was a pretty uh, a pretty rare rare sort of thing, at least until the 1880s. Well, and it, and it was a pleasant surprise for me. I'll, I'll let the listeners know before I ask this question that I, I live in Pittsburgh and conducted this interview from Pittsburgh, um, so that, that some of these club football matches might have uh, been occurring quite frequently in the late 19th century in Pittsburgh. Um, so your chapter on Steel City soccer was a pr particular interest to me. Um, so, but I am curious, what about Pittsburgh in the late 19th century made it a good case study, in your opinion, to describe the development of soccer in the U.S. during the late 19th century? Well, Pittsburgh was, like many other places, you know, as a, a growing industrial city with, um, in, uh, with a growing uh, immigrant population, especially from um, Great Britain, England, and Scotland in particular. And I wanted to, to give a concrete example of how this process developed uh, in the United States. So in England, we see these small sided kicking games and then that uh, they begin to form, you know, clubs in the sense that we think of today. And then it, it begins to take off, although uh, the growth of the sport was pretty slow, uh, even in England for the first decade or, or decade and a half. Um, and so in the United States and a place like Pittsburgh, you do eventually begin to get um, permanent clubs being formed. Now they're soccer clubs. Uh, with the codification of the rules of soccer, those eventually come to the United States. The, the, uh, the rules are codified in England in 1863, and then they're first published in the United States in 1866. But we really don't see uh, a, a rapid growth until the 1880s. And so Pittsburgh is just kind of representative of a lot of places like Philadelphia, like New York, like um the area around Patterson and Kearney, New Jersey, uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, these are areas that, again, are industrializing areas, areas where um, immigrants, especially from the UK, are coming in, in in larger numbers. And they, be again, bring their traditions and their uh, recreations with them. And so they start to form soccer clubs. And I thought Pittsburgh was... Uh, hadn't really gotten a lot of attention or was not a well-known uh, location. But again, it sort of showcases the role that uh, particularly Scottish immigrants play in, in organizing the game. I think we, we tend to think of soccer as, a, as an English game, uh, but the Scots played a big role in, in many areas around the world, but especially in the United States in, in um, launching these clubs. It also was a good opportunity to show some of the challenges that these soccer communities face in terms of teams dropping out, uh, find it, finding it hard to to um, to acquire uh, consistent locations to play, you know, finding fields that they can use because the city is increasingly growing and 
open spaces are becoming harder and f- harder to find. There is a little bit of um, industrial support, especially in the 20th century, from some of the larger uh, industrial concerns in uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, the Homestead Steelworks and others, uh, for instance, sponsoring uh, soccer clubs or sporting clubs more generally. So I wanted to use uh, Pittsburgh to kind of illustrate this broader development of how we go from really very little evidence of clubs to uh, not only clubs, but organized leagues, uh, international uh, friendlies being played between teams from Pittsburgh and places like Toronto. And eventually we get national competitions within the United States. No, that's fascinating. And as a Pittsburgh resident, you always hear about the history of the Pirates or uh, pit football and, and to know that Pittsburgh had such a, a deep, um, you know, rooted vest, vested interest in soccer is fascinating. I, I mean, the Pittsburgh River Hounds, the local USL team would love to know that. I'm sure uh, they could play that <laughs> on their promos more often. Um, but you also, I, I was fascinated by uh, the chapter because on the first pro soccer league in the U.S., you said you surprisingly note that um, the first pro soccer league was the American League of Professional Football, and it was formed in 1894 by six pro baseball owners uh, on the East Coast. So I was curious, I'm sure listeners are curious, uh, why would six baseball owners organize a professional soccer league, and were they successful in this venture? I think it was really a, a kind of a, a coming together of a bunch of different factors in 1894 that that led to this um, to the launch of the the ALPF, and I think part of it was the fact that the baseball owners had just recently reestablished their control over baseball as a professional sport in the country. So, for decades, there had been these rival leagues that had sprouted up and competed for players and um, competed for territory. And so by 1894, um, they had pretty much cleared the ground, as it were, and they owned essentially a monopoly on uh, baseball as a major professional sport. So they could decide where teams were, who got what, um, you know, particular region or territory. They could uh, suppress player salaries uh, through um, contracts and the reserve clause and these sorts of things. And so I think from a financial perspective, they felt really comfortable uh, and they they felt like here's an opportunity to maybe expand our um, our control over professional sport in a, in a different way. And they had seen the success of intercollegiate football. Obviously, by that point, they had seen or heard about the success and the the success of uh, of soccer in England and and in Scotland, uh, and so they it it does seem as though there was a general movement towards some kind of professional football uh, at that period, and for a variety of reasons, maybe as a specialist in intercollegiate football history, you might know better than me, but. Uh, there was really not a push to make that into a professional league, at least at this point, or certainly not um, at the same level as, say, baseball would be, um, and not played by college players, I guess, more specifically, uh, at least openly. Um, and um, and they, the, the baseball players also were not interested in playing intercollegiate football because the risk of potentially serious injury. And so they were sort of casting about, okay, we want to have a football league. What rules are we going to use? And, and, and eventually they settled on the association rules or soccer. And I think they did it because they felt like this had potential. Uh, they felt like it was an opportunity to almost like create another professional sports uh, revenue source. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that they felt like it was going to replace intercollegiate football. You know, the intercollegiate football games, college football games filled stadiums in the fall uh, every year. And I don't think that the owners felt like they were going to replace that with soccer. Instead, they were going to play soccer games during the week. Uh, They were going to play soccer games after the college football season ended. Uh, And so this was an opportunity to utilize their stadiums more to raise more money um, and to have another kind of professional sporting project, I guess we could say. Um, so I think that was the motivation uh, 
at the time. It came from that place of financial security, of the sense in which they had a monopoly over professional baseball, the sense in which um, a professional football league seemed to be uh, something that people were talking about and they wanted to they wanted to be involved or they wanted to be in control of it. Um, so I think that was the main motivating factors. Um, it didn't turn out very well for them. Um, they weren't experienced in, in running a soccer league or in maybe even understanding the, the way the game was played or even how physical uh, the game was. Um, I think maybe they felt like baseball players would be able to take up the sport pretty easily. Uh, I think they relied on having fairly small squads so that they could keep wages down and costs down. I think they uh, maybe overestimated what kind of a draw they might get, considering that they were starting teams from scratch. Um, there was initially talk that they were going to only recruit players from within their particular territory, but that kind of got thrown out the window. So like the Brooklyn team, for instance, was basically imported from Fall River. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, the Baltimore team about, you know, almost half of it was imported from England. English professionals were brought over. Uh, so I don't think there was, they maybe overestimated how popular this kind of something created whole cloth out of nothing, not emerging from within the existing soccer communities would be. Uh, and so the, the crowd sizes were pretty small. Um, there was a, a few weeks were canceled by bad weather. And um, and then maybe most telling of all, there were rumors that a new professional baseball league was going to be uh, starting in the fall. And so I think that sort of spooked the owners. And when you combine that with the costs, with the low attendance, uh, they decided to scrap the whole operation after only a couple of weeks. So it was a pretty, that was a fiasco, I guess we might say. Um, we should also add that there was another league that was formed, the American Association of Professional Football, and this did emerge from within existing soccer communities, uh, primarily in Philadelphia and in Newark, New Jersey. And this league, there's not a lot known about it. In fact, it wasn't widely known about until maybe the last, say, five years. Uh, we, you know, people knew about the the ALPF, but the existence of the AAPF was really not. Um, not established uh, in, until the last, say, five years uh, or so. And it, it does seem as though it was designed to weaken the ALPF, to, to be a challenger, to be an alternative to the AA, or to the ALPF, too many acronyms, I guess. Um, and yeah, and I, I, so I don't think that helped, basically. Um, I'm not sure that it really hurt them but it certainly didn't help that they had this rival league that had started a week before they kicked off. Yeah. And actually the ALPF, the, the baseball owners kind of investing in soccer does kind of connect a little bit to present day when you have uh, different ownership groups, I guess, in professional sports investing in MLS teams, and then I guess more established premier league teams. So it, it might just be a story too, of just, businessmen looking to um, find other avenues for income uh, makes perfect sense, actually. Yeah, I mean, right. The um, with a Dodgers owner, right, just bought Chelsea. And of course, right here in Massachusetts, the Fenway Sports Group owns uh, Liverpool. Um, yeah, I mean, again, maybe it's one of these things that uh, these ideas that we think of are very contemporary and modern and actually have deep historical roots about baseball owners trying to to broaden their revenue stream and, and again, to create, um, you know, to, to dominate professional sports of all sorts of different types. Well, we've talked a lot about um, men in soccer, but we, we'd be remiss to, to overlook the important chapters and some of the more um, interesting chapters in your book on women playing soccer in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about why women uh, were drawn to soccer in particular. Mm -hmm. It's part of general changes and, and trends in the late 19th century, uh, especially the establishment of women's colleges and then the, the, the effect of more and more young women attending colleges overall at the end of the 19th century. And so, um, you know, educators and physicians and other people were, were looking for 
activities and recreations that they felt would help to strengthen women. Um, because there was still, of course, a sense that women's primary role was as mothers and as, uh, you know, to give birth to children. And so uh, it didn't seem appropriate to have them play the rough sort of sports like uh, like intercollegiate football uh, or, you know, other sports like boxing. Uh, and baseball by this time had been firmly established as a kind of male game, um, you know, a professional game that had still a, somewhat of a dubious reputation. Um, and so it was not seen as appropriate for women. So other activities like cycling and tennis and croquet and those sorts of things were, were deemed, um, you know, useful enough at strengthening women's bodies, but not so strenuous as to damage women's bodies and prevent them from, from bearing children. And so soccer then emerges as one of these sorts of sports that's viewed as uh, appropriate enough um, for for women to play, and so it becomes established at at these uh, educational institutions at at colleges, not only um, the women's colleges, especially in New England, uh, but also at uh, at normal colleges or teachers' colleges across the country. Well, and and something else that kind of another significant moment you note in the book is World War One, the role that World War One served as perhaps the greatest reason for the growth of um, competitive soccer in the United States. And, and I think, I believe you said it actually ushered in the golden era of soccer, which, which is, was the 1920s. Um, so can you tell us more about the impact of World War I on the development of American soccer during this period? I think the war was um, almost served as like an accelerant of, of trends that were already in process prior to that point. So we talked about Pittsburgh and we talked about other uh, other cities where uh, soccer communities had been established um, all around the country. Um, I mean, we can talk about this later, but my next project is working on, um, on soccer, the history of soccer in some of these other areas that maybe aren't as well known uh, or didn't have the kind of uh, a profile that a place like Philadelphia or St. Louis or even Pittsburgh for that matter would have. But Um, So soccer had been established uh, and was played in a variety of countries, uh, I mean, uh, communities all around the United States uh, at the end of the 19th and into the early 20th century. And then World War I really, like I said, it kind of um, sparked a a tremendous growth, uh, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is, again, um, I guess it could be seen as as a little bit of a version of military soccer where you had uh, it's essentially a male dominated uh, world uh, where there is free time um, to engage in various recreational activities, and has, as has been the case in militaries, you know, around the world, they were often looking for opportunities to uh, to give their the soldiers something to do to fill their free time, so they would be gambling or 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 um, engaging in otherwise. Um, you know, negative activities from the perspective of their uh, commanders. And so sports were one of those tools that they could use. And of course, with, uh, you know, U.S. soldiers going overseas, they were exposed to soccer, but which by that point, especially in England, is obviously the biggest, uh, biggest spectator sport. It's a fully professionalized sport. Uh, France, uh, the game was not as developed in France, but it was still widely played and popular. Uh, and of course, it was played uh, by Belgians and, and you know, other people on the continent as well, uh, including Australians and New Zealanders who also served in, in Europe during the war. So they were exposed to this sport. Um, they were exposed to the popularity of the sport. They were exposed to the high, higher level, maybe perhaps, of, of play. A lot of the soldiers maybe came from uh, from areas where they had never been exposed to it before, so it was new. Uh, it was fairly easy to learn, if difficult to master, I suppose. Uh, it needed very little equipment, so uh, from the perspective of the military and the organizations that helped sponsor recreation during the war, like the YMCA, it was fairly cheap, uh, and they could send over uh, thousands, tens of thousands of soccer balls. Uh, you know, if they're not inflated, they take up very little space. They're easy to replace, uh, even locally. Uh, they can be carried pretty, 
uh, pretty easily. But, you know, as compared to, say, baseball, which requires a lot more uh, cumbersome equipment, and then uh, American football is maybe even worse in that regard, right? It requires a whole bunch of specialized equipment uh, for all the players that's difficult to replace. Uh, and so soccer was seen as a, as a, as a perfect form of recreation uh, for American soldiers. It was also seen as an opportunity to encourage inter-allied cooperation. So American soldiers could play against Canadian soldiers. American soldiers could play against French soldiers or Romanians or, or whoever. So it was, it served a kind of, I don't know, diplomatic uh, purpose uh, in that sense. Um, they also felt like it had, um, you know, the skills of soccer were seen to be particularly applicable to trench warfare, you know, having quick feet, being able to move o- o- over rough ground very quickly. All those sorts of things were seen as positive benefits of the sport. Um, for soldiers. And so large numbers of American soldiers participated in soccer games when they were in Europe uh, or in England. A large numbers uh, watched, were spectators of of soccer games while they were in in the service. And so when they came back, uh, you know, they came back to these communities that often did have a history uh, did have a a background or a foundation of soccer. They had leagues, they had teams, even if many of them had to disband during the war. Uh, and so it it sort of, you know, came together in this uh, very positive way as far as the growth of the sport. So, uh, and you know that that 1920s was, you know, the kind of the peak of um, early American soccer for sure. But then, you know, I'm sure myself, all the listeners are, are curious to know, um, why didn't soccer continue to grow in the U.S.? I mean, post 1920s, that's probably one of the big questions a lot of American sport fans have on their mind. And I, I found it interesting um, that you said its growth was stunted not because it was un-American, but because it was too closely associated specifically with British Protestants. And I was wondering if um, maybe that's a two part question, but uh, can you expand on this for us about, you know, why didn't soccer can continue that upward trajectory and and maybe that what that close association with British Protestants, how that might have hurt it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, well, in a in the broad sense, um, you know, the 1920s, you have the establishment of the American Soccer League, which was a professional, fully professional uh, soccer league, and um, and it was organized within the soccer community. So unlike in 1894, it was people who had experience. Uh, with the sport, who who knew the game, um, you know what the American Federation, what's now known as U.S. Soccer, ha- was established um, what uh, about a, almost ten years earlier, uh, and so you did have a kind of uh, institutional or administrative framework to help to organize and and sort of shepherd this league in a way that didn't exist in the same sense in 1894. I mean, there was the American Football Association. Uh, w- existed in 1894, but uh, as I talk about in the book, it's unclear what their attitude was towards the ALPF. I, I think they uh, resented uh, the baseball owners and felt like they were encroaching on their territory, on their sport, on their um, you know their turf, as it were. Um, but that doesn't that's not ha- a problem uh, in 1921 when the American Soccer League forms, and it, it's really successful. Um, for, uh, I mean, arguably for eight or nine years, uh, it does suffer from some of the common problems that, uh, that plague soccer communities, including Pittsburgh, of infighting, of uh, arguments over control, arguments over rules, uh, you know, just general, a, a general inability to come together and, um, you know, and, and to, to resolve disputes without them becoming, um, uh, you know, particularly damaging to the sport as a whole. And then, of course, the um, the Great Depression in 1929, um, the American Soccer League was was centered primarily on the East Coast again, in New England and, and the New York, New Jersey metro area. And um, when the Great Depression happened, um, that was combined with this series of infighting um, that really led to the to the decline of the game. Um, not the disappearance, 
uh, because the, the second American soccer league would be formed, but it was much smaller um, and uh, didn't have as near, uh, didn't have nearly as much of a cultural or social presence, even in places like New York as it, as it did um, earlier. Um, as far as the connected to British Protestants, I think, uh, again, if we think about a place like Pittsburgh or another uh, location that I talk about in the book, uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, uh, the British community tended to be, I mean, like a lot of immigrant communities tended to be fairly insular. Uh, and so when you get other uh, uh, people from other countries, uh, in the case of Holyoke, French Canadians, Germans and the Irish uh, oftentimes the British community did not necessarily welcome them with open arms, shall we say, um, and sort of kept to themselves uh, and in many cases uh, prevented uh, the Irish in particular from joining um, established recreational associations in Holyoke. And I think um, those communities then became more attracted to a sport like baseball or to their own. Uh, recreational traditions like the Turners, for instance, in the German community. Um, obviously, the Irish have reasons not to, um, not necessarily to be attracted to soccer. Uh, but uh, so I think that was that's part of the reason why, um, you know, why it it had a limited, uh, at least in the 1920s and 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 even uh, a little bit later. Now that changes. Uh, you know, during the 1940s and the 1950s, uh, I haven't, I, I, I stop in, in the 1920s when it comes to Pittsburgh, but of course, Pittsburgh later would have, uh, you know, a, a kind of revived soccer community that would be centered more on uh, Central European immigrants uh, and Ukrainians and Hungarians and, uh, and those sorts of folks. So it does change. Um, but in that initial period, I think it was uh, it did have a close association with the British community and um, and they often didn't enjoy necessarily the best of relationships with these other immigrant groups. Well, and, and it's obviously this is much past uh, your book and what you focus on. But, you know, you would say today um, soccer has obviously become much more popular in the United States and it's not eclipsing American football, obviously, or maybe NBA basketball. Um, but, you know, we're probably about to go as a country collectively a uh, soccer mad here in about what is it two months until the world cup. Um, yeah. so, so it, we're almost there where that, that, pe- that kind of peak interest. And I think people always, um, start to question, um, you know, is this the moment where soccer, I'm it's sometimes maybe that question's a little bit in the past. Cause I really do think soccer has grown a lot in the United States, especially in the past 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, you point out that, which was a pleasant surprise for me, that that soccer has one of the richest and oldest sporting traditions in the U.S. Um, played here longer than any country outside of Great Britain, uh, which I did not know and was was very surprised to find out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, just to interrupt you, you um, when we were talking before, you were talking about reading errors, and I I guess it depends on whether you want to how you want to count Canada. Uh, you know, whether Canada counts as part of the United Kingdom still in the late 19th century, because Canada did have uh, a soccer association and a a cup pr- before the United States. So um, so I guess that's a, a, if I had to rewrite it, uh, I would rewrite that part of the book. But yeah, so if we take outside of Canada and the United Kingdom is probably more accurate, I guess, but well, I'm sure the U.S. Soccer Federation would like to just state claim to to the U.S. only, but uh, no, it, it's it's. I think it's really an interesting thing to to note the rich soccer history as we kind of again go collectively soccer mad. Um, but I am going to ask you. I know this is a, a you're a historian. This is a, a book of the past. But um, since we have an expert in the field with us, um, where do you see U.S. soccer now, in your opinion, and and what is its future in this country? Do you see a continued upward trajectory? Um, do you see any, maybe even any correlations to that golden era of soccer early on? Mm-hmm. I think some people might argue that we are currently living in the golden era of, of U.S. soccer. Um, I mean, especially if you consider the success of the U.S. women's national team uh, over the past few decades. Um, certainly from an international perspective, things have never been better. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that 
part of the issue here is often how we define success or or how we uh, want to position soccer within kind of American culture more broadly. I think if we are, if the expectation is that soccer is going to be as popular a, of a professional spectator sport as baseball or American football or even inter you know college football these days, then you know soccer is never going to live up to that. Um, at least, probably not. You know, uh, not in the near future, uh, certainly. But I think if we if we if we try to uh, understand it in terms of its presence as a as a sporting subculture within many communities across the United States, we can see that it it's, has a very long and rich and deep history, and that you know more uh, certainly in the second half of the twentieth century, you know more young people played soccer than any other sport in the United States. Um, you know, soccer video games were hugely popular. Uh, in the United States. So, I mean, soccer has an enormous cultural presence. It just is not as popular as NFL football is or something like that. So I think soccer has been a huge success in the United States. Uh, you know, if if we just try to judge it according to these, you know, a more uh, diverse set of criteria rather than its success as a major, uh, you know, Profession, men's professional sport, I suppose. Um, so I think the future is is bright. I think, um, as I said, and as you said, the video games, the accessibility of uh, international soccer, uh, the the presence of more and more players uh, internationally, more and more uh, owners. Maybe that's not as big of a draw, but uh, so I do think uh, you know the awareness and the place of soccer in American culture more broadly has probably never been higher than it is at, at the current moment. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what ha- happens. You know, we have the World Cup coming up, and then of course North America is hosting the World Cup in 2026. So. Um, I guess we'll have to wait and see how things are at that point. Yeah, I'll probably be one of those people, and I'm sure you will, trying to find a ticket to that uh, 2026 World Cup. And it's probably not going to be cheap, if I had to guess. Uh, (laughs) um, I did see the list of prices, and yeah, it's, it's something, that's for sure. Yeah, I might, uh, I might have to just stick to watching at a bar or something. Um, But, you know, well, Brian, we've taken up a lot of your time and and we really appreciate your time. Uh, But before we go, you kind of referenced this a little earlier in the interview, a little sneak preview. Um, Can you tell us about a little bit about what you're working on presently? Sure. I'm well, I mentioned earlier that that soccer has um, I guess my my next project is working on um, looking outside of these major centers of uh, soccer playing in this same period, really 1880s to 1920. Uh, you know, a lot of the attention in terms of my own work, but in terms of other people's work, has been focused on Philadelphia, uh, Chicago, St. Louis, New York, New Jersey, uh, even Fall River to a certain extent. And these are the places where they had large, well established um, soccer playing communities. Um, but there were other cities around the country where Soccer was again a, a established and a long term, uh, what I would call a sporting subculture. It's never the dominant sport, really. Uh, I mean, baseball is always really popular in these areas. Intercollegiate football, again, is always really popular. But soccer is there, and soccer can attract crowds, and and there are competitions, and there is interest. Uh, and so I want to just tell the stories about some of these other areas around the country where there were soccer playing communities and maybe focus a little bit on, um, on the people who were involved, the people who played the game, the people who, uh, were fans of the teams, uh, and, and talk a little bit about their stories and, and how it fits maybe more into the, the culture and, and the, the, the society of each of these individual locations. Well, I mean, that sounds like a great project and one that I'll personally be looking out for. And I do encourage, again, as the World Cup, as we noted, two months away, we are in the, the, the you know, strong period of European soccer. MLS is closing down. With all this stuff happening right now, um, I highly encourage all listeners, if you haven't already read Brian's book, um, From Football to Soccer, go get a copy. Um, learn about the rich sporting uh, tradition of the game in the United States uh, right before the World Cup begins. 
Um, but Brian, I, again, I want to thank you uh, for your time, for being on the show today. Um, I really enjoyed it and, and take care. Well, thank you for having me. 